All right, we're going to talk about microphone pickup patterns. So these are the four main pickup patterns. You have cardioid, omnidirectional, bidirectional, supercardioid, or hypercardioid. And we'll talk about each one of them really quickly. First of all, a cardioid pickup pattern, I kind of put this heart shape up here upside down. We think that's where it came from. Uh, cardial, cardiac, related to heart, cardioid shape. So a very typical cardioid mic is a, is a SM58. If I'm talking right here, do you think it'll pick me up? No. So it'd be something like this. Now you can pick me up and now you can, right? So it picks up in front, kind of in this pattern. Really good for about three inches. Uh, you start getting more than three inches away, you have what's called the proximity effect and pretty soon you can't hear me very much anymore. And now you can hear me again. I'm gonna jump down to this one to show you the opposite. So a supercardioid or hypercardioid mic would be one of the shotgun mics like this one we have here. By the way, if we're indoors, we don't really need the wind filter. I tend to keep it on just so we won't lose it. So this one again, but now you could pick me up, okay? However, where this one's really good at about three inches and then starts to drift off, this one is still good two to three feet. All right, so that's why it says supercardioid or hypercardioid. Basically, that's showing again kind of the pickup pattern. Probably shouldn't taper off like that, though. It's probably more kind of like a, a flashlight beam going out. Okay, these are both unidirectional also. I don't have that up there. They only pick up in a one direction, unidirectional, one direction in front of them. What do you think omnidirectional means? Have you ever heard of omnipotent, all-powerful? So omni means all directions. If this was an omnidirectional mic, which it is not, but we will pretend, it would pick me up right here and right here and right here, right? It picks up all around. The most common omnidirectional mic is actually a lavalier mic that you wear right here because you never know if the microphone's going to kind of drift off one direction or another, and so it just tends to pick up all directions. Uh, I should say most of the people that purchase them and a lot of the manufactured mics tend to be omnidirectional, but you can get a unidirectional cardioid lavalier mic too. And then last is the bidirectional mic. It's a figure eight pattern. It's kind of like bicycle. That's why it's bidirectional. And it picks up on two different sides. Again, I don't have one of these out here. Oh, wait, yeah, I do. All right, so this isn't pretend, this really is. This picks up on the front and on the back, or if you were to position it in such a way, you could have two people sing on this side and on this side. Uh, the nature of this mic is, is that it works that way. How did I have that? There we go. Uh, it works that way without having two microphones inside of it, but a lot of bi-directional mics are really just like having two transformers inside one capsule. So it can pick up on either side. This, this particular one, a Sheps, would probably be like a $3,000 microphone, by the way. So the bi-directional figure eight mics are often more expensive. Uh, so are the omnidirectionals. That particular one would be anyway. And it would be useful, I guess, if you had two sound sources, like maybe two people singing, one person on one side, one on the other. Again, just holding this up for the heck of it. So uh, you could have one person sing one side, one on the other side. I would just use two mics for that. The more common application would probably be just to get something in stereo. So you want to have a different signal in your left and your right ear. But those are the main pickup patterns. Learn them. Cardioid, omni, bidirectional, supercardioid, hypercardioid, and then the actual microphones would be a shotgun mic and uh, unidirectional was the other thing I wanted to have you say. I didn't have it up here, uh, but I want you to remember that it's one direction, one direction, all directions, usually not a long distance though again. Probably more than six inches, you're starting to, to drop off. And also not a long distance, but bidirectional. As you already noticed, now I ask you to actually fill those in. Again, on my Google Docs, it says they're all number one. So number one is omnidirectional, number one is bidirectional, then you have number one unidirectional, and then number one cardioid, and then finally number one hypercardioid.
Not my best comical moment, but that's okay because you, in my heart, are number one. That's why I have so many number ones. And now, number one, because you're number one, draw the pickup patterns for the following microphones. So now I have you draw them. Do you know how to draw them? Can you draw? Are you a Hegstead artist? And can you do it without looking at the cheats that I had before? All right, have you ever heard anyone step up to the mic and have the uh, air coming out of their mouth, hit the microphone and just sound like a little explosion? That's called a plosive. I'm pleased to be here today and pop. Student power, right? It would just kind of pop. So those are plosives. Those are consonants like P, B, K, and T. If you have a name that has a plosive in it, you can try it out. Carry, Walker, um, Barry, Tracy. You can put your hand in front of your mouth and don't let anyone see it because they'll think you're a nerd. But you can hear the plosives. P is one of the best. So those are plosives. I've told my students, if you ever hear one in an assembly or something like that, and you point it out by shouting, that's a plosive, I'll give you candy. I'll laugh secretly inside at how much of a nerd you are for saying that. So what do you do to keep the plosives from exploding on the microphone? Well, a windscreen does a little bit of that, but you can also use a pop filter. That's what that word is, and that's what that looks like right there. I always tell everybody, well, first of all, I tell them it looks like Mrs. Chingus' sister, assuming she had a sister. Uh, you might remember she was in my classroom. She does publicity here at ALA. But the actual pop filter, as you can see, is a ring with what looks like nylon stretched around it. Black pantyhose. But anyway, you put that between you and the mic, and pff, no wind is getting through that. Not very much anyway. Another useful thing for a pop filter is you get a can of pop that's full of sugar and or aspartame and caffeine and all that crappy stuff you guys drink, the rock stars and the energy drinks. And you put a, a glass down, you know, you got a glass here, pop filter here, and if you pour the pop through, it filters out all that crap and leaves you just with pure water, a pop filter. All right, here it says, demonstrate proper microphone selection and placement for different audio recording situations. What type of a microphone is used for a sports broadcast? Well, that's a headset. So it's not just headphones, because it has one more thing attached to it, right? That's what we call a headset. It's got a little headset microphone on there so you can talk, and it's also got the muffs. Sometimes it's a single muff. Have you ever seen that? A headset that just has a microphone and one ear muff? So uh, you can have a, a two headset which can give you stereo or maybe in some cases you hear yourself in one and you hear your co-anchor in another or the, the technical director or something in the other ear. But at any rate, often it's two ears and a microphone for a headset. My gosh, how many sisters does Mrs. Chingus have? Then I ask you to demonstrate how you would place microphones on a live band. It says a live band performance with drums, guitar, bass, lead vocals, and backup vocals. Uh, I think I've got everything there that I just said. Yeah, we don't show a keyboardist. That's often part of a band. But I tried to kind of take out the uh, color there of the microphone. But you would have a microphone, and this happens to be a handheld microphone, right? So that's a, that's a gimme. You already get that one. So you put a microphone there. Where, where else would you put a microphone? Well, you could mic the amplifiers that these guitars are plugged into, but you would have to draw that. And if you care to do so, draw some amplifiers back here with some speaker cabinets. Sometimes they're all in one. And put a microphone on the speaker of the bass and of the guitar. And that's probably what you have to do. But what if this dude's playing an acoustic guitar? If you want to, you can pretend that's an acoustic guitar. You can put a microphone on this guy. You can even put two microphones on an acoustic guitar. And now I want you to pretend that one of them is singing. You decide. Is it the bassist, the guitarist, or the drummer that is doing the backup vocals? Put a mic on that. And then how many mics would you mic uh, the drum kit with? You could mic everything. And so you'd put a mic on what would be the snare, a tom, a tom, a tom. This symbol, with the two symbols that come together, is called a hi-hat, and that would be another symbol. Typically, there's at least three more symbols, actually. 
because a, a drummer likes to have a, a ride cymbal. They just ride, and they like to be able to crash a cymbal or two. But we'll just say you got a hi-hat, these drums, oh, the kick drum I forgot. And, uh, and then, let's, well, let's say that there's more cymbals, because there's a reason why I'm saying this, because there would be. There would usually be at least two cymbals for sure, a ride cymbal and a crash cymbal. Would you mic all those things? In a live performance, probably not. That's a lot of miking. So one thing you can do is you can just have a pair of stereo overhead microphones. And so they're up in the air and they come over maybe from each side and they just pick up the drums. But you would almost always still have a mic on the kick drum. That's kind of the heart of the rock and roll band. You have that kick that's usually pounding the beat out so everyone knows how to dance. Otherwise, they look like salmon trying to jump upstream. You gotta have the kick and sometimes it's in sync with the bass and uh, that's the lower end and you've gotta have that there and that solid and then everything else kind of comes out on top. Even though the only thing people realize they're listening to is the singer most of the time. But this is how I would do it. I would mic that, I'd mic that, I'd mic that, and I'd probably put an overhead on the drums and a kick, a microphone and a kick drum. If I was in a studio, yes, I would mic every drum. But if you count that all up, you're probably at around 10 microphones and that's a lot to manage. You go ahead and draw it the way you would do it. That's a happy nerd there, isn't it? says, what equipment would you use to record sound effects for use in an action movie? So he's got basically shotgun microphones. Well, what is this furry stuff he's got over him here? Well, that's actually a blimp with a serious wind filter. And sometimes you actually refer to them as dead cats. Have you ever seen a blimp, an old airship? So that's why they call them blimps and you point the microphone at the actors rather than having him wear a lavalier. Okay, so he's using those. He's got uh, microphones handheld on stands, shotgun microphones. He's got them in wind filters, which are in, encased in a... Actually, I should show you, so I'll put it on the screen. Uh, that's what a blimp looks like, a microphone encaged in, in kind of a plastic shell with a windscreen on it and then over the top of the windscreen he's got a dead cat. Then the cables come into his lunchbox. What do you think's really inside of there? How about a battery powered recorder of some kind? A battery powered portable recorder with a blimp or windscreen on the microphone. When you use a left and right microphone you are recording in stereo. If I only have one Shure SM58 microphone, can I record in stereo? Now, I could pan that so it's going to either left or right, or sending the same signal, not different signals, the same signal to both ears. But to get a different signal to going to both ears, to be able to tell directionality, if I were to close my eyes to be able to tell what's coming from my left and what's coming from my right, I need two microphones, like two ears, what if they make earrings, matching earrings? So this is stereo microphone recording, and this is what? Mono. That's showing you a description of cross-miking techniques. A lot of times you call them X and Y. And so one technique, especially if it's a shotgun mic, one technique is to go like that. Another technique is to go like that. And yet another technique might be go like that. Uh, so again, an XY cross miking technique. So how might you mic a grand piano? You'd want to hear it in stereo. You want to be able to tell that you're like coming from the bass keys up to the top keys. And it'd be cool if it comes across your head and from left to right or right to left, depending on how you want to do it. Uh, so you'd need two microphones for that, right? And then you could use that cross miking technique. So you'd have to have some boom arms coming off the microphone stands, probably on either side, coming in so you could do a cross-miking technique. Uh, another way to do it I'm going to talk to you about would involve using the three-to-one rule. But uh, first we'll watch this YouTube video to see what they say about the three-to-one rule. Now the three-to-one rule is a good way to avoid phase issues in using multiple microphones. The rule says uh, to take the distance to the nearest sound source and make certain that the next mic is at least three times that distance away. Let's say your singer is 
six inches off the microphone, you want to make certain that you're 18 inches apart to your next singer. Uh, in a choir setting where mics are being hung traditionally from above, you may be further, maybe two or three feet from the closest singer. Uh, the mics should then be either six or nine feet apart to avoid these phasing problems and avoid the use, uh, urge to use more microphones. That can just cause all kinds of problems. Now, while phase issues can still be a problem at these distances, the reason this works is the second sound source at that distance is far enough away that the signal from your main sound source is much louder than the second sound source coming in. So as you saw, the three to one rule suggests that whatever microphone is uh, picking up something from the source, the second microphone has to be three times more distant than the source to that microphone. So if we say, we'll make it easy like it is up there. Well, that's, that's pretty easy. I'll make it even easier. We'll say this is one foot. All right, so I am miking myself at one foot. If I put another microphone on someone else, I've got to have that how many feet away? Three feet. Otherwise, you get what is called phasing or phase cancellation. And that is because this mic will pick me up and then this mic will pick me up just a fraction of a second later, but it throws the waveforms out of phase and it starts to sound funny. Zzzz. That's my uh, interpretation of what phasing sounds like. So the three to one rule. I, I write here, how would you uh, mic a singing quartet? So if you had four people singing, how would you mic them? Think about that. You could mic them like this, where you have all four people standing like this, or how would you do that? Let's say that it's not live. If you have all the control in the world in a studio, how would you mic a quartet?